just uh, just wanted to segue for a second. Um, so this is Tori Estrada, and he is going to answer the questions that are already coming up in the audience around the cost and the policy, because we do know that that's an important trigger. Can we afford to do this? Well, we can't not afford to do it, but we also know where people's values lie, and so Tori is instrumental and crucial working at the levels of driving to Sacramento with John and Jeff all the time, getting the EPA and the Air Resources Board and all that he'll describe um, on board to support all the producers in this room to make these practices manageable for you. And then one last thing, um, I'm so thankful that you allowed your left brain to be very activated by all of these numbers. We will provide um, this for you uh, as a follow-up, I will try to get some of this information onto the Fiber Shed website as well so you can follow up with the graphs because they were moved through quickly. That will be on our website. And I also just want to clarify, for those of you who know about our life cycle assessment with finished garments, just know that this is the science that backs up that LCA. We are using objective, peer-reviewed science to understand the footprint of wool. And this is, this is, the, this is the baseline for all of that. So just keep that in mind as the day progresses. Thank you, Tori. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Um, thanks for uh, indulging us in the science. Um, I'm a person, I actually blend two worlds. I actually have a master's degree in environmental science, but also had the pleasure of working on policy. And they need to go together. We typically, have, I've worked in Sacramento for, and at the local level for about 20 years, and we typically get policy that's actually not driven by science. <laughs> And so the power of the Marine Carbon Project is actually engaging at the local level, working with producers, asking these kind of questions, informing policy from the ground up. And I know that sounds kind of uh, hokey, but it's actually the most important policy, particularly for climate, that we need to be focused on. So um, if Jeff is uh, worried about climate change and John's optimistic, I balance between the two. <laughs> Some days I feel really pessimistic. Other days when I'm working on the carbon project feel really great and I think a lot of people feel like that. Um, what I want to talk about, I mean when I talk about policy immediately people go, oh that's an expert's conversation, it happens in Sacramento, happens in DC and that's not what policy is. All policy is is a public expression of our values. A public expression of good ideas supporting public values. So, who has the highest stock in, in getting, getting engaged in policy? It's people impacted by climate change. It's people who could be the stewards around climate change. It's not the artifact of elected officials, primarily. It's not the artifact of Congress people. It's people with good ideas. People who want to work their land in a beneficial way, being engaged in coming up with ideas and figuring out the hard work how you make that happen. That's real policy work. So I'm not going to get up here today and answer all your questions. What I'm going to do is invite you to think about if you think what you've been presented today has some merit. The real question is, how do we get public support for it? How to be honest about what we know and don't know? And how do we engage agencies who, frankly, I will tell you, because I've worked on climate for a long time, who are really struggling to figure out the next set of strategies to get us to the numbers that John looked at, 350 parts per million. The state has a very good strategy of doing that. It'll probably get about 25% of the way. So the question is, for all of us as residents, what's the other 80% going to come from? Who's going to do it? How is it going to look? And I, I'm going to tell you right now, it's not going to look like what we do today. Energy, I worked on energy efficiency, I worked on water policy, it's all really great, there's a lot of great strategies. We're gonna need more. So what I invite you today to think about is how we might take this information, engage the local, regional, state level. I'm not gonna talk about the federal level today, it's a whole other question. Because um, California is leading on climate, that's where the opportunity is, and to sort of have a discussion. So I'm gonna lay out some of the components of what the carbon project's putting together. I think we've made a lot of progress, there's still a lot of work to be done. I'm not going to get up here and tell you that we're going to be able to deliver tomorrow on all the incentives and policy supports, but I think we're making progress. And what I hope to do is just sort of lay out where we are with that, and maybe you can see where you fit in. So next slide. Um, so as I said, um, 
the key piece of our policy work is actually knowing that we have validated carbon practices. So as Jeff and John talked about, we started out with compost. That was the easiest way to verify and see carbon in the system. Um, there are many other potential strategies to look at, but the first we start with is sort of research and modeling and making sure when we go up to Sacramento and say these practices can sequester carbon or address climate, that actually we have a, a foundation for that work. Next slide. So, as Jeff talked about, there are many other practices to think about. The Marine Carbon Project doesn't have the capacity to do them all. There may be some specific for the fire shed, and we've actually been talking to Rebecca about this, that we need to, to have additional research. And when I talk about research, and I'm talking about just laboratory work, but applied research, working with producers, working with ag specialists, working with grazers. So grazing is certainly on our next, you know, one of the most amazing things we want to look at. So right now, the Marine Carbon Project is focused on first compost application, but it's also looking at riparian systems, and we're hoping this coming year to look at grazing as well. Next slide. So the power of research is that we can go up to Sacramento and show the numbers you saw today, that that's where the power of doing a life cycle assessment is where the carbon product has done really great work. I think this model of having good research but being very clear about the positive and negatives of your practice is really an important conversation to have in the climate context. So this is the kind of information we're bringing up to Sacramento. Next slide. And also, one of the main questions we're going to get asked if we believe agriculture can play a role in climate is how permanent are the soil carbon and climate benefits? So doing the work to figure out and model out what the impacts of compost are in terms of sequestering carbon is a really important question that we'll get asked. It's better to do that research up front and have to answer that question before you get up to Sacramento. Uh, that's why it took us five years before we even talked to policy people. We had to do the hard work first. Um, I put this slide up, and it, it, it's a kind of esoteric slide, but on the international front, there's been many firms that actually go to countries and ask, you know, advise them on sort of what strategies should look like. And it's interesting, this is a four-year-old slide, but you'll see the third category there, terrestrial carbon agriculture, is already seen at the international level playing a significant role in addressing climate. That is not the case in the United States. The international scene, I think there's been much more work, much more forward thinking around that. It doesn't mean the United States couldn't get its head around that, but agriculture has not been a main part of the positive conversation around climate, as climate agriculture can play a role in climate mitigation. It's been, what's the contribution of agriculture on the emission side? And there, there certainly is. So um, we're bolstered by this. There is, there's certainly work on an international level already looking at agriculture and forestry. Um, we have more work to do in here in the US context. Next slide. One more time. Um, so when we finished our research, one important thing that we need to do if you're going to talk about policy is if you're going to advance a practice, you have to put out a recipe of how to do it. People want to make sure when you implement a practice that there's a recipe. So it's like baking a cake. So if you want a good cake to come out of the end, you have to all the steps. So when we, we took the research we did, we actually have developed a protocol which for any uh, Producers who's working on graze systems has a recipe they need to go through to make sure when they apply compost that we have all the baseline accounting for it, how you spread it, how you verify you've done it, where you've done it, and how you measure it over time. So this is a really important piece connecting the policies that we brought to the table is the recipe of how to do that. So we're not going up to Sacramento and saying, well, we applied some compost and it has this effect. It's like, well, how will you do it on the ground? We've actually worked with the Environmental Defense Fund and a few firms, we actually have a final draft of a protocol that actually is now being submitted to the American Carbon Registry, which is one of the main California um, reviewers of carbon credits, um, mostly on the voluntary market. So the voluntary market is, for instance, if the city of San Francisco wanted to offset its greenhouse gas emissions associated with um, you know, an event, they can actually go to the voluntary market and say, we can't sequester or, or mitigate that carbon from our event with what we're doing. We want to go out and support a project or a set of projects that are known to be carbon beneficial. They can give that um, market some money 
and then that money goes to support practices like compost application. So we've developed uh, this methodology. Our goal is to not only get it in the voluntary market, but also the California's regulatory market. But if you think about it, and we get caught up in carbon markets, and that will be part of what we're looking at, but it's important just to have a protocol if somebody just wants, if you wanted to do it, if a producer wanted to go do the practice, it's good just to have the protocol out there and verified and reviewed. So we're currently working on that, and um, we hope that ACR um, will approve the, this protocol in probably a three or four month time frame. An important piece of that is public comment. ACR's process, there is scientific review, but they also take public comment. So it's a really important uh, process for us, not just to sort of have people um, comment, comment it and be positive about it, but really to kick the tires here. So look at the protocol. Does it have gaps? Are there things that are missing? So it's a really good iterative process that we're going through. Next slide. Hit it one more time. Sorry about this, it's still a little funny. Go back one. Um, so the next piece of the, the puzzle I'm putting together here is we, after we did our research and we are developing our protocol, we looked at the economic feasibility of the practice. And I'm giving you the, uh, a lens through which we looked at the compost application. So we did a feasibility study. Next slide. So we looked at um, the total cost for applying <coughs> compost to rangeland. Um, all costed, including material, transportation, measurement was $40 a ton. It's a lot of money. 40% um, of the cost that we estimated for that was, to, was, was steps you needed to take to actually take those carbon and get a credit on the market for it. So there's a ton of work you have to do to verify your project was done with high quality, to do the measurement, to actually have a broker actually take those credits. I'm not going to go into all that, but that's a whole range around um, actually monetizing the carbon, which is not insignificant, but um, is about 40% of the cost. The real true cost of the practice is, as you can see, the compost addition, plus the baseline monitoring, so you know what the carbon level you're starting off with, and then the monitoring over time to see that, to make sure you've actually had uh, carbon gains. So we started having this conversation around $40 a ton. People was like, well, that's not market viable. Well, I have you look on the left hand side of this sheet at common mitigation strategies that are already being supported by the market and by the public sector. Well above $40 a ton. So it's possible the challenge is, is agriculture doesn't have the same type of incentives. So when you're thinking about doing energy efficiency in your home, there's a whole ton of regulated market incentives that are going into that. Uh, who here has a PG&E bill? Raise your hand. 0.001% of your bill every month goes into a pooled fund that creates a billion dollars a year for energy efficiency. That's a public policy. There's a reason why we do that, because we, we want to support energy efficiency, we want to reduce our demand, that's a public policy. We don't have those incentives, the same type, in agriculture. And the reason why we don't is because we don't have, we have, actually haven't put up strategies from agriculture in the climate context, because we haven't had the research we have now. So this, is, this sort of sets, frames some of the debate we've been having with our climate colleagues around trying to bridge this gap between $40 a ton of what we have now available, which is a very limited amount of money. Next slide. And what I will say is, in most, the, the next two slides are sort of show you from, again, from the international context. If you look at, don't get hung up on the numbers, what this shows is the range of climate mitigation strategies and their, their cost and their potential. And you can see on the international context, there's a, all the ones in red are agricultural based strategies. So again, relatively, the strategies in agriculture do mesh with energy efficiency, transportation, all the other things in climate. It just hasn't been a strong conversation in the state of California. Next slide. Same here. This is a, a McKenzie group looking at a whole range of sectoral approaches to climate, and you'll notice that agriculture, fairly large in terms of the circle of its potential impact globally, and fairly low cost. Very low cost. 
Um, and the interesting part around compost application is that we start to tie together some of these sectors, like we bring in waste. Mm -hmm. So as we think about integrated strategies, actually the economics could potentially be better. Next slide. So bef before I go to the next piece, one thing I, I do want to sort of reflect on is our, when we, when the carbon project came out of the closet, so to speak, uh, two years ago, we started engaging at the county level, so Marine County, Sonoma County, at the regional level with the regional agencies, particularly the Air Quality Management District, who's arguably the sort of lead climate agency um, in the region and at the state level. And what we were really shocked by was a profound ignorance. I don't mean that to be um, judgmental, but it was a lack of fundamental understanding of what John presented today, the carbon cycle, the role of soils, and the potential role of agriculture. Absolutely no fundamental understanding of that. So policy work <laughs> is essentially education work we've been doing for the last year and a half. It's John sitting up, the same as you today, you're no different than uh, Governor Brown's lead advisor on climate, climate. This is what we told them. And it was a shock to them to understand this the first time they even heard it. So this is part of our challenge. So our policy work to date has been education and building a bridge between the agricultural sector, which we all work in, and the climate sector. And it's going to be one of our major challenges to get our climate colleagues to sort of understand this world. I think we're, there's a lot of receptivity to it, um, but I think we have a lot of work to do. The other interesting piece, I think, why we haven't had this debate yet is because I think there, what the Carbon Project shows is new research and new technology is allowing this debate to happen. As Jeff talked about, um, there was a really big question if we could actually measure the soil carbon that we saw in our gains in compost application. We're able to do that now. We probably couldn't have done this 10 years ago. So the research is allowing us to have these new discussions and have these kind of conversations. And frankly, in the energy and water sector, there's been more time, more research, and there's a language that people speak around that. It has not been uh, a conversation yet around soil, so that's part of our challenge. So the next piece we're looking at is, well, how do we put, how, there's not going to be one big pool of money that's going to drop down to a rancher or producer and to cost out $40 a ton or whatever it is for the other strategy we come up with. It's going to be like every other sector, transportation, energy, actually has to pull revenue together. That's what they do. Um, and that's a challenge because you have to have intermediaries who can actually organize that. Next slide. So we're looking at um, a set of economic incentives. So this is just a representation of, if you think about the pie as $40 a ton, where the potential other revenue could come in. So I talked a little bit about the carbon market, which right now at its best is $15 a ton, and will go up. But if you're a producer, that's not gonna, that's not gonna at least have you break even. So the conversations we're having um, at the local level uh, with the county and the region is there are local greenhouse gas mitigation money that are coming online. A lot of it is being uh, amassed by the counties. The counties have set for major projects a cap of 1,500 tons per year of emissions. If you're a project that goes over that, you either have to mitigate on site or you pay what is a developer fee. Sonoma County has been collecting, well, probably close to $5 million of this money it puts it back into its local climate action plan and funds energy efficiency and all the other things you see on the landscape. We were having conversations. Um, Marin, for example, doesn't have a certified climate action plan. They actually jumped out ahead and did community choice aggregation and a number of other climate strategies. They are now writing a climate plan that's going to have a strong agricultural component. Having that in their plan and having this revenue coming through CEQA, local greenhouse gas mitigation could provide uh, funding for uh, agriculture. Sonoma actually has an agricultural um, sector in their climate action plan that has been basically nascent. So we're having conversations with them about sort of what could agriculture do in Sonoma. Now if you look at the numbers that were back on that slide of other mitigation strategies, uh, Napa County is actually writing a climate mitigation plan and it's going to basically be charging also a fee their fee they're proposing is going to be $250 per ton. That's when they looked at all the climate mitigation strategies being implemented by counties and cities.
that's the number on average that it was. That's what they're going to charge. So my question to agriculture in Napa is, at $40 a ton, if we were paid $250 a ton, we could actually be making money <coughs> through land management. So these things are not set yet, but the important piece is we need to be involved in those discussions when these plans are being put together. Um, so um, the other pieces we're looking at as well, um, we do have current federal conservation funds that come through resource conservation districts through EQIP. So Marine Carbon Project actually has a uh, grant through the USDA to, to look at, as Jeff mentioned, carbon practices. And our goal in our program is to uh, inform the NRCS's uh, conservation practice to explicitly include carbon. So potentially a producer who could go out want to do compost application on your rangeland could potentially be eligible through EQIP for a carbon beneficial practice. That's not set yet. That's a conversation we're having with NRCS, but I think there's a fruitful conversation there. And the biggest conversation we're having is actually at the state level. Um, AB 32, which is the, the climate law for California that sets a very aggressive target for greenhouse gas mitigation, and actually the state has a plan of how to get to that goal. Agriculture was not in the original legislation nor the action plan um, at all. So, actually right now, the state of California is rewriting its scoping plan, its work plan for AB 32. And agriculture, we're working to get agriculture to be mentioned. We told them, like, if you want producers to be engaged in this conversation, the first thing you need to do is in your policy is actually say that you value it. It's got to be there. So we're having that conversation. But we're trying to go beyond that. There is also a more detailed work plan in that document that will lay out specific strategies by sector. So we're going to get agriculture in that document, and then the question will be, can we identify specific practices? We're putting compost application up, not as the strategy, but as an example of what agriculture can do. And what we need to do is come behind that and say, here are 40 other practices, for example, that should also be there. Uh, we've had some really amazing conversations with the agencies who I think are starting to get this. Our biggest challenge right now is ARB. Uh, they're engineers, they're not soil scientists, so we're having to uh, interpret soil science for the uh, engineers. So, but the state incentives piece is it's significant because um, as soon as we get language into that AB 32 scoping documents, agencies like California Department of Food and Ag, which has been fairly inactive in the climate sector, now has um, a, a mandate to do something around climate around potentially soil. Uh, Department of Conservation, which funds a lot of the resource conservation districts and a lot of conservation practices who have been underfunded, um, we're actually advocating that their funding be restored to provide technical assistance not only for conservation to producers, but particularly to look at climate and carbon. So um, sort of setting up the RCDs as sort of the part of the technical assistance project development um, support that producers need. Um, the other thing I will mention, and I don't actually come from the agriculture sector, I come from the energy sector, but <laughs> one thing we would love to talk to you about, um, in the energy sector, when you, and maybe some of you have this in your home, the way of financing, a lot of the financing works in the energy sector is if we assume we do replace windows, we're going to save uh, energy in kilowatts, let's say 10 kilowatts. We can actually use that savings in your bill there are actually financial mechanisms that are used to sort of take that savings to pay back loans. So there's a financing mechanism in most climate mitigation strategies that drive potential debt service. Question for agriculture is, does decreasing your water, increasing your forage, is there an analogous cost saving financial structure we can develop in agriculture? Maybe not, but it's something we want to have a conversation about because if we could, it just would help us, even if it's going to be a dollar a ton, would help us pencil this stuff out. Um, let's switch to the next slide. So I want to go through this really quickly because I know we're running out of time, but this is just a, uh, the architecture of some of the agencies we're looking at. I'm going to highlight a few here. So I talked about the protocol development 
one thing we're doing right now is um, Marin County, for example, could, under CEQA, uh, as I mentioned, as part of its mitigation on the project, could have agriculture as part of the mitigation strategies that a project developer could consider. So in addition to providing shuttles to offset increased traffic and greenhouse gas emissions or doing energy efficiency, agriculture could actually be, strategies could be on that CEQA mitigation list for the region. Um, and for example, for the Marine Carbon Project, and it's early, about two years ago, when Lucas Films was expanding its facility, it was going to um, basically exceed this 1,500 tons per day of emissions through its operations. And it had a lot of on-site mitigation it was going to do, but it wasn't going to be able to reach that point. We actually had a conversation with the county, and Lucas said, wow, we have not only this rangeland on site, but we're surrounded by it. Could we actually think about doing compost application or grazing? So Marin County said, we would love to do that, but we need the Air District to sort of support that as an official mitigation strategy. So we have our protocol with the Air District, again, as an example of an agricultural strategy. And they're actually in the process now of approving it. I expect approval in the next couple months. So if you're a county writing a climate action plan, or you're a developer and you have grazing land, or grazing land next to you, or your public utility San Francisco Public Utility Commission is doing a large uh, retrofit of their uh, water infrastructure needed to offset the climate impact of that. They have all this rangeland. They would have approval from the region to use compost application and emerging agricultural practices and be paid to actually do that. So that's one area we're looking at. For compost application, we're also looking at, you know, for people who are particularly interested in that, we're having a long conversation with Cal Recycle, who's main policy directive over the next 10 years is to reduce the amount of uh, waste going to landfill by 75%. 80% of that waste is compostable material. So the conversation we've been having with them is if we want to get rangeland compost on the rangeland, we need to divide, divert that material. We need to have more facilities like local composting facilities composting that and incentives for producers to apply that compost. Cal Recycle has been very interested in this, so that whole chain of looking at compost. Um, so our hope is potentially we might get an incentive to a producer to apply compost as part of the offsetting of $40 a ton. The other big um, pot of money, just to put it that way, um, that's coming up is, have people here heard about the state cap and trade program under AB 32? Well, what's not talked about is every time they do an auction of those credits, about $500 million of revenue is generated, about a billion dollars a year. There is an investment plan for the state of California to take that money and reinvest it in climate strategies. We worked hard to get agriculture as part of that investment plan, and we're continuing to uh, work with the state to make agriculture a piece of that. And what we recommended is threefold. One, there should be additional investment in R&D in the agricultural sector. We're not going to see the innovation that the Marine Carbon Project did at scale um, without investment from the state. The Marine Carbon Project was a great project, largely philanthropically driven. We won't be able to scale up and look at all the potential practices that you might be interested in. The state needs to make a, an investment in R&D. So if grazing. We need research for grazing. We need applied research in grazing to really ask the question, can grazing management improve carbon? If so, it should be part of the state's plan. The next piece we, we suggested was we need technical assistance for, to producers through existing mechanisms, RCDs and others, to provide technical assistance to producers, farmers and ranchers, to be able to uh, do assessments of their property, identify the practices, conservation practices that they can implement, and figure out which ones are technically and feasibly fine. Uh, feasible to implement. So we're suggesting an investment there. And then third are direct competitive grants and incentives to uh, producers or project developers who want to implement carbon practices. So that, I think we're going to get funding for that. I don't know what the number is going to be. It, I think it will be fairly significant. At least to start to jumpstart research, to do demonstration of the, the practices and to provide some economic incentives for the practices. The last thing I will say, I know this is covering a lot of ground, um, 
is the state is also going to be working on climate adaptation. So a lot of its focus has been on reducing greenhouse gases. Uh, John's chart shows that even if we, we reduce all our emissions today, we're still on a trajectory of having climate-related impacts. So the question is, how do cities, towns, individuals adapt to that coming impact? Agriculture needs to be a major part of that. As we've seen, the impact of climate on agriculture is going to be significant. So there's an emerging conversation at the policy level about how do we support planning and action at the local level. And agriculture is going to be part of that to make sure that we can adapt to the climate change that's coming. So that's another piece of the puzzle we're looking at. Uh, next slide. So these are just quickly our recommendations, um, which we can send out to the ones I just summarized. Next slide. So, this is, so these are all the elements of the CARBON project that I think make the, the project viable. So research, we have a protocol written that gives people a recipe of how to take a, a, a management practice to scale. Economic feasibility backed by economic incentives, but the most important piece is actually implementing the work on the ground. Um, having the technical assistance, having the tools to be able to measure carbon, and then having the ability to potentially aggregate projects. So instead of one-off projects for compost application, let's start to scale this up at some level. Next slide. So that's what Jeff talked about that we're working on. So the Marine Carbon Project, in a way, is, is, is setting up a model for this. So all those pieces you see, we're not just doing it for Marin. It actually is a way of developing a sort of package that we can offer to others and in other regions, other sectors. Um, it may not be compost application, but at least having all the sort of technical uh, ability to know how to measure carbon, how to use the models, um, having the sort of contracts of permanence that we're going to need to have for producers to make sure the carbon can stay there. So we're, we're developing basically all the architecture uh, in Marin to then offer hopefully next year uh, free. The piece I'm hoping we're going to be able to do is actually also offer, so this thing is not a one-off project, is a set of economic incentives to actually, every year that would be funding, we might be able to get to every ranch and every producer who would have enough funding and geographies to sort of start to start to scale this up slowly. So that's, that's our, our vision. Next slide. <coughs> oh, you, you can, this was just, so our proposition to the state of California around this is not only, so the practices that the compost application um, gets, and we have all these potential public benefits. So beyond the soil carbon and climate mitigation, there are all these other public benefits that come out of it. And what we're saying is, not only from a climate perspective, but if producers voluntarily want to do these practices for all these other beneficial things, there needs to be a public support for that. It needs to be in policy, it needs to be in economic incentives and supports to make this happen. So. That's what we're spearheading. We would love people to be involved with it. If we had hundreds of producers going up to Sacramento supporting this message, it wouldn't be a, a tough sell at all. But that's what we're, we're hoping to do over the next year. Um, and um, I guess I'll take questions. Any questions? <laughs> Any measurements of the um, effects of fiber? We're all fiber, most of us are fiber producers. Mm -hmm. Very different than cow manure right. or steer manure. Um, they also fart where fiber animals generally don't. So that adds to the gas emissions. And um, but have you done any measurements of the manure quality, volume kinds of things in this project? We have. I'll have. Rebecca responded to fiber, and Jeff could respond to what we've done in the carbon project. <laughs> uh, for fiber, we did have Dr. Marcia Delange do uh, an assessment based on a, a stocking rate for cows uh, that, that there's an equivalent for sheep. So if you are looking at healthy grazing at one cow per acre, that uh, equivalent in sheep terms is about uh, seven to eight sheep per acre. 
and that's a healthy stocking rate according to some of the um, soil science coming out of the California rangeland system understanding. So we built uh, the life cycle assessment with that stocking rate in mind. And we took into account enteric fermentation for sheep, which is sheep farting versus cow farting. Um, what else? Um, yes, <laughs> enteric fermentation. Um, so I think that those two things were addressed in an LCA that you will see at the end of today after we go through the wool mill study with Amber Beek. She'll present to you Marcia Delange's science that just takes all of this livestock that was focused on cows, but it actually we can transfer it very easily to an understanding of sheep. It's, that answers your question. Jeff, did you have anything to add to that? Belching is more the issue. And it's a very competition because most rangelands in the world that are now raised by livestock were or, or continue to be raised by other wild animals and humans. And, and so to suggest that livestock are new, or this, this impact that this is somehow new to the arrival of livestock is, I think, arguable. There's also a whole range of um, the phanotrophic organisms that live in the soil and actually absorb methane and utilize it as an energy source. So there's a very dynamic system here we're talking about. It's not quite as black and white as it's been painted sort of in the public, um, public press. Yeah, and my, my only sort of parenthetical to that is um, the life cycle assessment that um, Rugged has talked about that we did for our work. Um, the amazing thing is that we now have Marcia and other folks that actually can take that life cycle assessment generically and apply it to different types of systems. And so uh, the work we're doing at the state level is to get the state to understand. I think there was a, a perception at the state level that agriculture hadn't really done its homework. But we brought, we brought this LCA that in some ways is more rigorous than what we do in building energy or water or transportation models. Oh my God, I mean, there's tons of error in that. So, so this is the advantage I think we bring to the conversation is bringing that sort of analysis to it. It's actually very powerful, but um, Marcia's work is, is really amazing in that regard. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, can you say a few words about the carbon market? Sure. Is there something specifically you want to know about? Uh, how does it impact the uh, agricultural? How does it impact? Well. The, there are several carbon markets. I talked about the voluntary market. Um, so there are a number of people out there. Um, actually, the, the global voluntary market standard is the BCS, Voluntary Carbon Standard. You, you can have any idea, as long as you have some research and support, you can actually put a protocol forward. And once that protocol is accepted, then people can buy project carbon credits from a project that you develop, right? So that's the voluntary market, which right now is extremely volatile. It only pays probably five to eight dollars a ton. There's some agriculture in those voluntary standards, largely not in the United States. They're overseas. World Bank, for example, has their own soil carbon uh, protocol in Africa. Uh, I don't know how rigorous it is, but there it is. For California's regulated market, uh, agriculture has not been regulated under that market. I think there's a fear that it will be. I don't think it's going to happen. Um, Largely what we're, uh, the market is around is for fossil fuel, so for Chevron refinery, transportation emissions, which are really hard to get at. Everybody's trying, but they're really hard to get at. It's going to go under this cap. So what essentially the state does, it says, okay, uh, uh, refineries, you cannot now emit over this number. If you go over that number, um, you either have to find mitigation on site or you have to buy a carbon credit. So that's what the California's cap and trade program is taking each of those regulated industries, taking a piece of emission reduction they need to do and then opening it up to projects who can they can buy emissions credits from. Again, agriculture, because it's not an AB32 policy plan, has not been a strong component of cap and trade. That's what we're trying to change. So can we get projects into uh, the cap and trade system, um, it's going to be a hard pull um, to get agriculture in there, not because it's not due, but the state of California has got so many potential standards it's looking at. Um, 
So, I, so what I would say for agriculture, for our stuff, is this is my opinion, the market, the carbon market will play a role, but probably a fairly small role uh, right now, just because of the price. Um, but we're sort of looking at, you know, all revenue. But uh, the carbon market, I think, will flourish in the state. Um, the question will be is, is, I think some people think it, the carbon market alone will solve the problem. I don't think it will. I don't, I don't, I don't think it's the, the panacea the state of hope is going to be. Um, it's going to require more innovative uh, funding mechanisms. I mean, we need to start talking about, at the local level, around counties, around um, tax breaks. We need to talk about economic development. We need to really look a lot broader than we have in the climate sector to find the revenue that only, not only supports climate mitigation, but also can support the activities, the economic activities that are behind them. And again, I mean, I live in Petaluma, and Petaluma's uh, economic development plan, very strong on theater and all those kind of things. It doesn't have an agricultural component, supporting producers to bring food. It just, I mean, that's a whole other conversation we're having with American Farm and Trust and others. It's sort of like, there is a potentially strong local component to support agriculture. We need to have that as part of the, um, you know, in our quiver as well, so. You want me to explain this to yeah, there's, yeah. We, we're hoping that in your packet, on your seat, if you're a producer, that you could pull out this, um, because, again, the carbon market has gotten, I, in my mind, it, it seems like a, ooh, <laughs> to be quite frank, I don't have a very, like, positive interpretation of the carbon market, and so what we also think is, Tori's saying, it's this suite of different um, possible income streams to support people on the land to do the thing that is best for the land and best for them and best for the climate. How do you have a win-win-win, but how do you leverage everybody over the hurdle to get there so that the California wool mill can eventually purchase wool and any of the people who own wool, wool mills in the audience can purchase wool from producers they know are doing this. How do we help the producers get here? Um, it's not just going to be carbon markets. <laughs> so um, this could you explain what you yeah. what you might use this for? And yeah, so for those that are interested in uh, applying compost as a practice, what would be really helpful for us is to know that you're interested. And we, if you could fill out the survey, what we would like to do is is sort of to get a sense, at least as we go to audiences, about who out there is interested in compost practices, but also get a little bit more information about would you be interested in applying it? How much could you pay? Um, and what the, what benefits of applying compost that you're today you're most interested in? Is it the carbon? Is it the water holding capacity? What it is? So this would just be really helpful information for us to have is sort of more data about from a producer or um, end user what you might be uh, might be interested in doing. So if you could turn this in, and who should I give it to? Oh, up at the front. Well, okay. just you can leave them at the front table. That would be amazing. Okay. Thank you. Um, question? Yeah. Um, there's something called pest friendly, pest friendly certified ranching, and um, it allows uh, it, it utilizes practice like using guard dogs instead of killing wildlife predator or predator friendly, predator friendly, uh, and it's a certification for ranchers, and you know they 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 have associations and some marketing money and pamphlets and brochures, and maybe um, folks who are uh, farming their, their sheep uh, can also have some kind of certification that brings them together, and they have, you know, it's really kind of a cool thing. You can have a booth at Pioneers and... <laughs> I think that verification will come through, hopefully. Um, that could be a function of a nonprofit. That could be something that Fibershed supports. It could be another organization. It could be the resource conservation districts around that are, you know, that came out after the, the Dust Bowl and have all been about soil conservation ever since. There's lots of ways of verifying, and I think we'll find a team of people who supports and helps create that. And hopefully at no cost. It's just like if you do it, you don't have to pay every year, you just, you do it. And, and we all know you did it, and this is the way we know. Thank you everyone so much for going through the technical details of this morning. After lunch will be a very post-lunch. <laughs>